afternoon to our to our presentation on uh, integral ecology and building solidarity with nature. My name is uh, Father John Whitney from St. Ignatius Parish here in San Francisco, and I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we noticed that there's a, a number of names here that we haven't seen at other presentations or other things, and it's wonderful to have this this large community. Today, what we're going to have the opportunity to do is we're going to listen to a, a presentation by a, uh, Dr. Gilles Girard, and I will explain who, he, who that is in a minute. I just want to give you an outline of the day first. Uh, we will have our presentation, and then we're going to move into small groups for a little while. Chance to just mention if you hear something that you are interested in, chance to talk about the presentation generally or specific things that you heard in a small group. And we'll just do that for a little while and then come back to the larger group and a chance for questions, responses, uh, insights that you may have. Uh, so all together, we hope to be uh, spend about an hour and 20 minutes together, hour and a half, see how it goes. Um, I didn't do my math on that, but it'll all work out. But the most important thing today, and don't worry if you're like, oh, what's next? I will lead us through it. And like any good Catholic liturgy, I'm sure people will join us as we move along. So, um, Dr. Uh, today we, we, as I mentioned, we are pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Yale Giro, uh, who is a Jesuit priest at Georgetown University. He is an internationally known economist. He has a PhD in applied math from the École Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, he spent two years in Chad at a Jesuit high school, founded a center for street children there. He uh, entered the Jesuits in 2004. He was named the best young French economist uh, in 2009. He was ordained in 2013. He, uh, in 2017, he became part of the Nath Institute. Uh, in 2018, was a professor in South Africa at Stellenbosch uh, University. And since 2020, he has been a research professor at Georgetown, where he founded the Georgetown University Environmental Justice Program. Uh, I could go on and name some of his, he has numerous books, numerous publications. I think he also has a doctorate in theology uh, as well. Uh, he has worked as a quantitative engineer and science advisor for investment banks. This is a person who knows the world uh, of uh, business as well as the world of theology and who has brought his uh, considerable skills as an economist into the issue of uh, environmental justice. So we are pleased to welcome him today, uh, to thank him for being here and to hopefully learn from him on this issue of uh, building solidarity in nature. So. Jill, uh, Jill, Jill, welcome to uh, our group. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Maybe I, I would ask one thing. I would add one thing, sorry, which is the fact that I served during five years as the chief economist of the French European Bank, which is the French analog of USAID. And yeah, I just wanted to mention this because this was a very, very deep and, and, and moving experience for me to work at this level, you know, with people from the IMF, the World Bank, <clears throat> et cetera. So yeah. Um, so maybe, yeah, I'm going to share my screen and uh, to try to present you some facts and ideas that I share with my team because I'm here in Georgetown for 10 months now. Um, and I was asked actually to launch a new center, which is called the Environmental Justice Program. So I thought the best would be that I would share with you some ideas that we are working on with my team um, and then maybe reflect a little bit from a theological viewpoint on, on these ideas. So let me just share my screen with you. Now you should see my screen, I guess. Um, and I will just uh, adjust this. Wait a minute, oops, yeah, like this. And now you should see everything. Um, yeah, I'm also uh, uh, extraordinary prof at the Sustainability Institute in Stellenbosch University. Um, and, and I should add something which is McCourt because um, I was appointed as a prof at McCourt School of Public Policy uh, in Georgetown University. Let me just begin with maybe with a map that you know, I don't know, um, which, uh, which we uh, constructed in 2014 
uh, with um, some French economists at the French Development Bank, which is just a way to understand where are the places where people will be hit by climate change. Climate change meaning, meaning here only um, global warming, um, the change in, in the, the cycle of water and the rise of the sea level and the erosion of the, the soil. So of course, this has not captured the entirety of the consequences of global warming, but this is at least part of it. And the, the color is, is simple. I mean, if it's dark blue, it means you are extremely exposed to these consequences. And if you are just, uh, you know, light yellow, then you're not exposed to this. So with this criterion, you see that the most vulnerable <coughs> countries are Sub-Saharan Africa, with the exception of Southern Africa here, and, and Central Asia and a part of, let's say, uh, Southeastern Asia here. And a little bit of Middle East um, here. So some countries near the Andes here on the, on the Western side of- I can't get the video. Here, let me try. Let's see, wait a minute. You, you can't get my picture? I think the rest of us have it. I'm not sure why someone may not be getting it. So I stopped sharing. We had it a minute ago. It disappeared now. Try it, try yeah, it because again. I, st I stopped sharing. I yeah. think it's fine. It must just be a, a, a singular issue on someone's computer. Yes. So. Okay. So I sure, shared. Yeah. Again. Okay. Yeah. Good. So you see it again? Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, so this is one, just one aspect, but of course there are, there are already a number of issues related to this very simple uh, diagnostic, which is that the most exposed countries are also very often the poorest, the poorest ones, especially in Africa here, as you see, or in Asia, and also those who are less responsible for greenhouse gas emissions with one big exception, which is India. But otherwise, you know, in, in South, I mean, Africa, the entire continent is responsible for something like 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's, and it's by far the most concerned co uh, continent by the consequences of climate change. So there is a kind of fear of injustice, which is that those responsible for climate change and global warming are the less exposed to the consequences of it. This is well known, I just wanted to, to remind this. Now, of course, what I said is just true for one aspect of climate change, which is, as I said, you know, the continuous long run consequences like the rise of the sea level, the erosion of the soil and, and global warming itself. Now, if you, you, you take another viewpoint, which is um, the, exposition, the exposure of a country to extreme events, that is floods, droughts, and typhoons, then um, the picture is completely different because Africa is no longer the most exposed continent. Now it's Asia by far. And, it's, and again, Southeast Asia. So you see, depending upon the viewpoint, uh, you may have a completely different understanding of the consequences of you know, the ec ecological crisis, which means if we want to think in terms of justice, environmental justice, then in the first place, we have to uh, agree on what we mean by global, you know, global warming, ecological crisis, climate change, because this, this is a poly crisis actually, and depending upon the viewpoint you, you share, then the countries concerned by this will be completely different. And therefore the questions of justice will be also very different. Um, here you have also a, a, a map which shows those places which in 2016 were the most exposed to extreme events and lost, and, and, and I mean, to the, and the, to the economic consequences of these extreme events uh, induced by global warming. So again, as you see, Asia is quite hit by the problem, but also if you just take the economic consequences, then the US are quite exposed to this and Europe as well. So economic consequences might be very large depending upon, of course, the value of the capital that is exposed to it. If, if you have a big flood in, in Louisiana, it's not the same as having a big flood in Myanmar, for instance, obviously. So depending upon whether you just look at the physical consequences, then you have this map. And now if you look at the economic consequences, then you have a completely different map again. And which means again, that we have to be very cautious and precise in the way we want to describe the events that we are facing and against which we want to, to fight. Now, another point that I want to mention, which is also a way to understand the consequences of, of global change or global warming, 
is uh, this is a result that has been published in, the, in Nature uh, three years ago now, uh, which is based on the following remark, and I'm sure most of us have made this experience, which is that it's uh, paradoxically enough, it's easier to run, uh, to, to do your jogging, let's say in the savanne in the south of Chad, than in the forest in Vietnam. Since I tried both, I can, I can tell you this, even though it's much hotter in, in, the, in Chad, in the savanne, obviously you have something like 40 degrees Celsius in the shadow. Uh, in Vietnam, you only quote unquote have something like 35 degrees Celsius. Um, but the big difference is humidity. It's much more humid in the jungle, obviously. And it's the combination between humidity and heat, which is very hard for the human body and very painful. So here in this graph, which is just a clinical uh, empirical observation, you have a, the deadly frontier above which the combination between average daily temperature here on the X axis and average relative humidity on the Y axis becomes lethal, becomes deadly. In other words, if you, you're experiencing a temperature like 40 degrees Celsius, then as soon as the, the relative humidity in the atmosphere is above, let's say 30%, then it becomes deadly for a human body. So not for Travis, who is with us, Travis Russell, because he's very strong physically, but for a normal body, it's very, it's very hard actually. And, and if you're exposed to this more than six hours without having the possibility, let's say, to rely on air conditioning, then you, you just die. Now, what a number of climatologists in this paper in Nature uh, did, they tried to, um, to anticipate um, the size of global land area on Earth that will be exposed to more than 20 days per year of lethal combinations of heat and humidity at the end of this century. So you can see this on the left here. If you follow the red curve, the red curve is called the RCP 8.5. That's the nickname for the most pessimistic scenario of IPCC. So today, fortunately, we, no, we are no longer following this scenario. It seems that we are somewhere in between the 8.5 and the 4.5 here. So we are somewhere between, in between. But if we were to follow the 8.5, then you would see that approximately 50% of <coughs> land area on Earth would be exposed to something like 20 days per year of lethal combinations of heat and humidity by 2100. If we succeed in, in reaching the RCP 4.5, which leads to plus three degrees at the end of the century, 3.5, and then only quote unquote 35% of global land area would be exposed to 20 days of lethal heat and combination. Uh, heat and humidity combination. Now, what size of the of human population would be concerned by this problem? So that's on the right here. So if you still follow the red curve here, you see that at the end of this century, this would be something like 75% <clears throat> of the human population on Earth at the end of this century. And if we succeed in, in reaching the yellow curve here, then it's only, let's say, 50-55% but still half of the population will be exposed to lethal combinations of heat and humidity more than 20 days per year. Of course, this, is a, this, this, um, this simulation relies on a very heroic assumption, which is that people are going to stay where they are. In, in real life, of course, they're going to move, they're going to migrate, they're not going to starve and die peacefully. So this means that if this happens, if half of, of the human population is exposed to more than 20 days of lethal heat and combination, lethal combination of heat and humidity, then of course there will be gigantic migrations. Where will this happen? This is the next map. So let's begin with the most pessimistic scenario, the RCP 8.5 here that you can see, sorry. <clears throat> um, and then here the color means the number of days per year where people will be exposed to these lethal combinations. So if you are white or very light yellow, it means just a few days. If you are dark red or brown, it means virtually every day. And if you are uh, yellow orange, it means almost one day or two, one every second, I mean, every second day. So as you can see here, uh, if we follow the RCP 8.5 scenario, then the entire Amazon basin becomes uninhabitable before the end of the century. 
and also Central America here. The entire Congo Basin and the Guinea Gulf here, a part of the, um, the Eastern part of Africa here on the border, and also a huge part of the littoral of uh, India. And again, um, Southeast Asia. So this is a theme which is very important, as you notice, Southeast Asia, whatever being the criterion you use is always uh, a victim of global change. So remember what we saw here. Um, so, sorry, oops, the Java Island here is exposed to extreme events, obviously, here again, and here again, you see. So <clears throat> I will come back to this, but Indonesia, especially Indonesia, seems to me to be the next multi country in the world. I will give more details to this in a few minutes. But let me let me go back still to this uh, to this scenario here, which is the most pessimistic one. Uh, you also notice that the southeastern coast of the U.S. is yellow, which means let's say something like 100 days per year. So one day over three, people will be exposed to little combinations of heat and humidity. <coughs> Same story for China here, on the eastern coast of China, with very small cities like uh, Shanghai, Shenzhen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In other words, this means that if we reach this situation, sorry again, um, there will be literally billions of migration, billions of climate refugees, especially in this corner where there are only, only already 1.3 billion people today and probably they are going to move. Now, if we are fortunate enough to succeed in reaching this situation, the RCP 4.5, remember, which is the yellow curve here and here, and which leads to something like plus three, plus 3.5 degrees of global warming at the end of the century, then that's the picture at the end of the century. And the very worrying aspect of this is that again, Southeast Asia is still <clears throat> badly hit. And again, it's still yellow, light yellow uh, in the US here and in China, and also in the entire Indian subcontinent. So which means again, nevertheless, even, even in this very optimistic scenario, then there will be lots of migrations. Now, of course, you might think, uh, seeing this, <coughs> sorry, that <coughs> of course, uh, people will rely on air conditioning. And that's not, that's not true uh, because uh, first air conditioning, as you know, is polluting. So to rely on, on air conditioning in order to protect oneself from the consequences of, of pollution is certainly a very bad idea. Um, sorry, there's someone reaching out to me. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, please. <clears throat> sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh, thank you. Um, and second, maybe you saw there was a report published by um, the, the, the US Army and the NASA in 2019 uh, asking the questions, what would be the reasons, what would be the phenomena that would prevent the US Army from uh, putting into practice its mission during the decade 2020? And so this has been published in 2019. And the answer was then back two things. First, pandemics. And this was before uh, the outbreak of the coronavirus. And second, uh, power blackouts induced by the overuse of air conditioning. So, and we have seen this in, in Texas last year, obviously. So, which means that we really have to take this seriously. Uh, there will be migration because it's not just, I mean, air conditioning would be a temporary solution just to gain, to win, to gain time, but not to solve the problem. <clears throat> now, you might believe that those climatologists who published this were very pessimistic. So, in my, with my team, we tried to duplicate with our own models um, these this results, and this is the map that we got. So unfortunately, we can just confirm the results of this map here for the RCP 8.5, the most pessimistic one, with one exception, which is the Congo Basin. We, our model seems to be much more optimistic on the Congo Basin, and honestly, we still don't know, we still under, don't understand why. We are still working on it, but we are exactly as pessimistic as they are for Southeast Asia, India, the Eastern coast of Africa, and also the South of the US, we are slightly more pessimistic for China. So who is right in this story? Nobody knows, and maybe we would never know because hopefully we would never reach this 
this crisis, this situation. But this means in any case that it's, it's a very, it's, I mean, it's serious, obviously, and that the main question for us is to do everything possible to try to avoid this situation. Um, unfortunately, a climate change is not just a question of heat and humidity. It's also, as I mentioned earlier, a problem uh, of, of uh, troubles in the water cycle. So this map has been, has been constructed by WRI, the World Resources Institute, which as you may know, is probably one of the best think tanks dedicated um, to uh, natural resources here in Washington. <clears throat> and what they have studied is um, the lack of fresh water by 2040. So hydro stress by 2040 at the world level. Um, if it's, if it's uh, white or light yellow, it means almost nothing. If it's yellow between 20 and 20%, if it's orange like France, where I come from between 20 and 40%, if it's red between 40 and 80, like Spain and Italy. And if, it, if it's dark red, extremely high, much than more than 80%, which means that people will presumably lose more than 80% of the access to fresh water they are enjoying today. And that's holds for Central Asia, Kazakhstan, where there are a lot of troubles today, and also uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and the north of the north of Africa. <clears throat> so again, I mentioned this: Indonesia is badly hit. So Indonesia is the country which will be, in any case, quote unquote, punished, whatever happens in the coming years and decades. I mean, 2040 is just the day after tomorrow. It's not the end of the century. So 20, Indonesia will both have typhoons. Uh, seismic activities, lack of drinkable water, heat, I mean, peaks of heat and humidity, which, which will make the entire country completely uninhabitable before the end of the century. If we don't radically change uh, the way we produce and consume and the way we produce <clears throat> today. So the, the big geopolitical question, and this is also a question of justice, is where are the poor people from Indonesia going to migrate? Uh, Indonesia today, these are 270 million people, mostly Muslims. Uh, that's the most populous Muslim country, Muslim nation in the world. And my guess is that they're not going to migrate to Australia because Australia will not be hospitable. And I'm very I'm dubious whether they will be able to go to you know, the backyard of China, which is uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, um, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a big question. Where are they going to go? I have no idea. But if we think in terms of global justice linked to the environmental crisis, this is certainly going to be one of the biggest questions we have, we have to face today. Now, another point is that this time, Southeast, Southern Africa is concerned by the lack of drinkable water. And you may know that um, Cape Town now every year is very close, go, goes very close to the, the day zero. That is the day where people won't have water on tap. Uh, which as you know is very terrible. I mean, nobody can survive if, if you don't have water on tap. Uh, fortunately, so far in the past five years, they were lucky enough to have a, a kind of providential rain just a few days before they would reach the day zero. Um, and, of, and of course, everybody's praying that this, this will go on in the future, I mean, the coming years, but it's no mystery that sooner or later they will reach, unfortunately, the, the day zero. So that's a big concern for South Africa. And that's also a concern for the US. So of course the map is not is a little bit biased because <clears throat> that's not true for the entirety of the country. Obviously main, the main and you know, I don't know whether you know the small, the small uh, village called Roseau, which is a French name by the way, which is very close, close to the, the frontier, the border with Canada. They have so much water, it's not a problem for them, but it, it will be a problem at the national level. And as you know, it's already a problem in California and Texas. So the US are not immune against this, this problem, which is a gigantic problem. Uh, what is the solution? For a number of countries, the solution is to try to desalinize water. Uh, so they would, they would just pump in um, uh, seawater and desalinize it. So this is exactly what Morocco and Tunisia are doing right today. Um, so when I served as the chief economist of the French Development Bank, we had a project uh, which would consist in funding a gigantic uh, plant for um, Morocco to desalinize the seawater uh, that would be um, that would rely on a gigantic solar plant 
uh, in Wazazet that has been funded both by the World Bank and by the, the French Open Bank. And then there you see there is a link between access to water and energy. In order to desalinize seawater, you need a lot of energy. And this energy must be green, of course, if you don't want to pollute even more. So you need to have renewable energy. And then you see that there is a, a nexus between water and energy. To give a counter example, Morocco faces exactly the same dramatic situation. Sorry, Tunisia, Tunisia here, faces exactly the same dramatic situation as Morocco. But uh, contrary to Morocco, Tunisia doesn't have a big uh, solar plant, solar power plant. And therefore, Tunisia, for the time being, cannot uh, desalinize seawater. So Tunisia is in a state of emergency already today uh, because they don't know how to solve the, the hydro stress that they are already facing and that will be worse and worse in the coming days or years. In Europe, um, what I know is that Portugal and Spain are already preparing uh, desalinization plans and Italy is doing nothing. So I spent a lot of time trying to alarm people, you know, alert people, um, politicians, especially in Italy, telling them, you know, you should really take care of the problem of water in Italy. And for the time being, it's a little bit like in the, in the movie, uh, Don't Look Up, I don't know whether you saw it, but I'm a little bit in the same situation as, you know, the, the character that is played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie. That is, uh, I keep telling this even on TV in Italy, and, and uh, honestly, nobody is listening to me. Um, the situation is a little bit French. less alarming in France. French and Italy. Say it again. Someone said something. Okay, maybe we will we will comment this later on. Um, and the situation is a little bit less alarming in France, but nevertheless, you know, to lose between twenty and forty percent of one's access to fresh water is not insignificant. And there again, the, nobody is paying attention to that, unfortunately, for the time being. Um, things would be simple if we had only just peaks of heat and humidity and lack of drinkable water, but unfortunately there is also the issue of biomass and biodiversity. Um, so this is a map that has been constructed by NASA, Mark Imhoff, who is a friend of mine, uh, in 2006. Uh, so this is, sorry, this is simply the biomass that is produced uh, on Earth thanks to solar energy, obviously. So here you see again, of course, the Amazon, the, the Congo rainforest, and, and again, the jungle of Indonesia. Now here you see the consumption of biomass, but by human beings. So it's a completely different map, obviously. And you see that obviously, I mean, in the US, we are consuming a lot, in Europe as well, and especially in India, especially in the north of India, and of course in China. And again, no surprise, in the Java island in Indonesia. So what is the net balance? This is the net balance uh, between um, what we consume and what is produced locally. So if you are dark blue, it means you're fine. And if you are black, it means then you consume more than um, uh, 10 times the production of your, uh, of, uh, of your ecosystem, regional ecosystem. So you see there is a large deficit in Saudi Arabia, which is not a surprise, but also in India, especially in the North, and also in China, South Korea, a little bit of Japan, and again, Indonesia here. A little bit in the North of the US and Canada here, as you see. What, is, what does this mean? It means that these re regions and these countries heavily rely on, on global trade, international trades of biomass, agriculture. This would be fine in a normal, in a normal world, but now we know, thanks to the pandemic, that unfortunately it's very easy to stop international value chains, and these make us very vulnerable if we just rely on these international value chains without being able to produce ourselves what we need. So a small virus uh, succeeded last year in, in interrupting many of these value chains, and some of them still did not recover today. Um, and so to rely so heavily on, on global trade, whatever being the efficiency of international markets for biomass is something I believe which is, uh, which is not insignificant. Um, but biomass, as you know, is just one aspect of biodiversity. It's the, let's say the zero degree of biodiversity. And probably you're aware of the fact that IPCC now has a small brother who is called uh, IPBS. Um, and the IPBS published a report last year 
uh, on biodiversity saying that essentially, roughly speaking, biodiversity is just in free fall in virtually every part of the world, maybe with a small exception, which is in Latin America. Um, one very striking aspect, uh, aspect of this is um, um, the, 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 the halieutic fauna, that is the fishes in the oceans. So here you have a picture of the density in fishes in the northern part of the Atlantic Sea by 19, so at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 1900. Um, so as you see, it was very, very dense along the, the coast, the eastern coast of the US. Uh, there were some fishes in the central part of the Atlantic Ocean and it was very dense uh, along the, the western coast of France and Spain and, and Morocco. Now, this is the picture today. <clears throat> um, so which means, and, and, all, and everybody working in, in the fish industry knows that, which means that we are destroying the trophic chains of reproduction of fishes in such a massive way that they can't reproduce themselves or they don't reproduce fast enough. And so they are disappearing. And so there are a number of oceanologists who just repeat for several years today that if we keep uh, uh, putting into practice the industry fish, the fish industry, as we know it today, and if global warming keep uh, aggravating, uh, which means that uh, water is, is getting warmer and warmer, then we won't have eatable fishes by 2050. We won't have eatable fishes by 2050. Now, having said that, I have a number of colleagues in economics or economists who say, well, so what? That's not a big deal because we are going to produce fishes uh, artificially, you know, in, in, in pots and ponds and these kind of things. And this will uh, create jobs and this will increase GDP. And then a question, which I believe is also a question of justice, environmental justice, is do we want to live in a planet where oceans will essentially be empty and maybe we will produce um, fishes artificially? Or do we want to live in a planet where we still have fishes in the ocean? And so that's a big question because it seems to me the reaction of my beloved colleagues tells something about the lack of relationship to nature. The belief that we can artificially replace nature, uh, which I believe is a strong illusion. And definitely the encyclical Laudato Si says, no, this is not possible. Creation cannot be just duplicated artificially. If we lose the fishes in the ocean, we are losing definitely something that we cannot replace. Um, even if according to some crazy economic models, this could be possible in terms of GDP. <clears throat> Another example of this, which also uh, highlights, I believe the link between environmental justice and social justice is the, the disappearance of bees. As you know, um, the uh, chemical products that we use in agriculture kills bees, uh, kill bees, and bees also are on the verge of disappearing in the coming decades. Now, when I say this to my colleagues, economists, uh, most of them or many of them, let's say, say, well, again, that's not a big deal. Yeah, you should take holidays, you are tired, um, you are too anxious. Um, because we are going to artificially pollinize um, flowers. Um, and then they dream of small machines, like small drones, you know, that would fly in the fields and, um, and gently artificially pollinize flowers, uh, taking the place of bees. And the answer to this is that's, that's simply a sweet, but absolutely, absolutely impossible dream. Because for that purpose, we would need such an amount of robots, of machines and energy to feed these machines that this is just impossible, technically speaking. So that's the big illusion of geoengineering, which is which believes that the technique will just save us from all the, the, the mistakes we are making. Um, my viewpoint is that the technique is absolutely necessary and we, we need to have a lot of progress and I will explain in which direction, but certainly not in trying to replace nature. That's just impossible. By the way, there are already regions in the world today where bees have disappeared in certain places in China, in the countryside. And what's happening there is not that people are replacing the bees by machines, they are replacing the bees by poor, by poor women. Poor women in the countryside, which pollinize flowers one after the other uh, by hand. So, and of course they are reduced to the state of slaves, more or less. And therefore the, the, main, the main point, my main point is to say, you know, if we keep destroying nature, then maybe we will be forced 
because this will become a matter of survival of mankind. We will be forced to try to replace nature by some way or another. We won't be able to do this by machines, but we will take the poorest among ourselves to do the job. And that's already happening today in China. Um, by the way, when I say that uh, even the survival of mankind is threatened, that's true. In as much um, as you probably know, uh, the permafrost in Siberia and in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean is already melting. And this might already today <clears throat> set free um, some quantities of methane, which is such that if we keep um, uh, setting free this methane, then uh, we are going to reach not plus three or plus four degrees of global warming at the end of this century, but plus six, plus seven, and probably then plus 10 in the 20, 20 seconds, uh, 22nd century, um, which means that then the survival of mankind will be threatened. Um, nowadays, I, I, and I am sorry to say that it's a little bit gloomy, but, <clears throat> but I don't think we can speak <clears throat> uh, in, a, in a relevant way about environmental justice if we don't take the big picture. Um, so water, global warming, and, and biodiversity is not the end of the story, unfortunately. There is also an issue with minerals. Um, it, it happens that we have a growing scarcity of minerals. So here you have some diagrams that I have published with a friend of mine who is a geophysicist. Um, and you can look just at here. Uh, this is the quantity of copper, zinc, and aluminum that we are extracting from Earth since the beginning of the 20th century. And as you see, these are exponential curves. And when a geophysicist sees that, he just says, well, don't believe that we will be able to do this forever. This is just impossible. Why? Simply because the quantity of copper, zinc, and aluminum and of every element in Earth is just finite. So this will have an end. And the question is, when will the end occur? And the answer is the most, um, the most alarming uh, mineral today is copper. So, According to the computations that we made with this colleague of mine who is a geophysicist, uh, we might reach the peak of extraction of copper at the world level before 2060. This does not mean that after 2060, there won't be copper anymore on earth. It will simply mean that the quantity of copper that we're extracting from the soil every year will just at best stagnate or a decline after 2060. We won't be able to increase furthermore the quantity of copper we are extracting from the soil. And this is a real problem. Why? Because it happens that green infrastructures linked to renewable energies require more copper than um, brown infrastructures linked to fossil fuel energies. So geophysicists are already telling us today, be careful with the use of copper today. We need to recycle every kilogram of copper we are using today. Why? Because we will need more and more copper in the coming decades, hopefully, when we will finally shift towards renewable energies. And it would be really stupid if you were prevented to shift towards renewable energies and therefore to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gas and therefore to avoid the catastrophic scenario I was describing a couple of minutes ago, just because we have just you know misused copper at the, at the beginning of this century. Um, just to give you an idea, the density of reserves of copper where we are now uh, digging uh, at the world level is 1%, which means that in order to have one ton of copper, we need to dig 100 tons of soil. Whereas um, 40 years ago, it was 5%. So uh, it has been divided by five within 40 years and the decline is still uh, going further. So so this means this means that we need first to recycle, but recycling, as you probably know, is just a way to, to win time. It doesn't solve the problem because if we recycle, um, you know, that's the law of, of quick convergence of the exponential towards zero. Uh, let's say so you succeed in recycling 80% of the matter that you are using, and 80 is in many circumstances and many fields the best percentage of recycling that you can reach. So suppose we were to succeed in recycling uh, copper at the level of 80%, which is not the case today, uh, then uh, the first round would be would mean that we would lose, we would just recycle, we would just you know keep 80% of the flow of extracted copper. 
And the second round would be 80% of 80%. And the third round would be 80% of 80% of 80%. And this converges very rapidly to zero. So recycling is just a way to, to gain to win time. And during this time, what should we do? We should invest heavily in research and development <clears throat> so as to find substitute to copper in uh, its industrial usage. Um, one very, a very simple example, but a beautiful example is that today it's possible to construct uh, panels, uh, photovoltaic panels, you know, PV panels, which are entirely organic or almost entirely organic. They don't rely on any mineral. Um, and you, you can put them on your window. I saw this in France, in Germany, and I'm sure people have done it in the US. I don't know where, but I'm sure this is already the case in the US. So that's the future. So this is high tech, but not high tech in the way, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos dreams of high tech. Um, it's high tech, which is very useful, uh, relevant, and informed by the real scarcity we are facing today and in the coming coming decades. Um, so yeah, of course, with the, the growing scarcity of minerals, there is also an issue of justice. Why? Because minerals are not spread on Earth in an egalitarian way. Far from it. So you know that China accumulates most of the the minerals on Earth. Russia also has a lot of them. Uh, there is a lot of cobalt in, in, in Congo. That's why China lost Congo, you know, it's not for philanthropic reasons. Brazil has a little bit of them, the US also, and France just has a little bit of hand, half me, and that's it. So which means that in the coming decades, we might have wars, not just quote unquote for water, but also for minerals, if we don't pay attention to that. And I, my, my position is to say, we have to think of it also in terms of justice. Um, otherwise, you know, it's just the most powerful in the room, which will, at the end of the day, be able to consume minerals. Um, and then this means either the US or China. Um, and so this, again, is a question of, of justice at the global level, I believe. <clears throat> now, very quickly, of course, there are issues linked to pandemics, which will be fostered and boosted by, um, by global warming. So this is so well known today that I don't spend time on this. Also the rise of the sea level, um, you know that for sure, just to give you an example of what's happening in, in Bangkok, Thailand. So this is um, the situation today. And then the optimistic scenario is that just this part of Bangkok would be underwater before 2040 and this part then in the pessimistic scenario. Same story for Jakarta in Indonesia. So you know that Indo Jakarta is no longer the capital city of Indonesia, essentially because of the rise of the sea level. Uh, which makes the city, uh, which threatens the city already today. Same story for, you know, in China, in Bangladesh, etc. I can tell you that when I, when I went to Vietnam as a chief economist of the French Movement Bank, um, they were highly enthusiastic uh, to work with us. Why? Because the Vietnamese government today is in a state of panic. Why? Because the Mekong Delta will be underwater before 2050. And the Mekong Delta happens to be the place where they cultivate rice for the entire country. Uh, today, 80 million people, but in a couple of decades, you know, 150 million people. Um, then the question is, they had essentially three questions. First, how can we slow down the pace at which the Laguna is going down because of urbanization? Second, how can we secure uh, rice plantations uh, as long as it's possible? And third, what is the macroeconomy of Vietnam by 2050 when we will have lost the Mekong Delta? So what we did at the French Open Bank is that we, first of all, we tried to help them in optimizing uh, the urbanization plan of the Laguna in order to reduce the, the pace at which the Laguna slow, I mean, uh, goes down below the seawater. Um, second, we found a new species of rice which resist against the salinization of water. And third, we began working on a, on a macroeconomic model in order to understand the macrodynamics of Vietnam in a couple of decades without the Mekong Delta. So I, it turns out that I left the, the, the bank before we uh, succeeded in building entirely this model. I don't know where they are today on this, on this stage, but, but we started at least working with uh, some Vietnamese economists on this. Um, to put everything in perspective in a nutshell, I think this chart is very helpful. <clears throat> um, and then maybe I will give some positive results and I will stop there so that we have time to, to discuss. Um, 
So here the X axis is the human development index. So the human development index, which is constructed in New York by the uh, human development office uh, of the United Nations uh, is built with three pillars. One is GDP per capita. The other one is um, health. Um, let's say the life expectancy at, at your birth uh, in good shape. And third, the third pillar is the level of education. Let's say the percentage of the population which reaches at least uh, primary school, the end of primary school. Um, so you construct an average of the three pillars and this gives the, the HDR, the Human Development Index. So the Human Development Index is always located between zero and one. And uh, the larger it is, the better it is for the population. So it happens that 0.8 here is was a couple of years ago, the HDI of Russia, and it was considered by them as being, you know, above 0.8, you are more or less fine. Of course, it could, all, it could always be better, but you know, it's already, already something. And if you are below 0.8, then it means that, well, you know, you could easily make progress in this direction. Now, the Y axis here is the ecological footprint, which is one measure, um, somewhat controversial, I agree, but you know, for lack of a better measure, let's take this one, one measure of the entropic pressure on natural ecosystems. So um, if the ecological footprint is below one, it means that you don't destroy too much of your ecosystems and you don't destroy them at a pace which is higher than the pace at which natural ecosystems uh, renew themselves. So you are safe. You don't need more than one planet to sustain your life. If your ecological footprint is above one, it means that you need more than one planet. The unfortunate fact is that we only have one planet. So here you have the, the line of the biocapacity, the carrying capacity, let's say, of the planet by 1961. Uh, so the ecological footprint was equal to one when we were here in 1961. Since then, having destroyed a lot of ecosystems and, and partially through global warming, but not only just because of global warming, then this line is going, is going down with time. So in 2012, it was here. And since then, most probably it must be somewhere lower, okay? So each point is a country. Every country which is above this carrying capacity line is not sustainable because if everybody was following the lifestyle of this country, uh, we would, the, the humanity would need more than one planet to survive. And as you see, most northern countries are here. So this means they have a very high HDI, that's good, but they also have a very high ecological footprint, which is just non-sustainable. Now, very many poor countries, especially in Africa are here, which means they have a very low ecological footprint. That's very good, uh, especially in Chad. Chad is somewhere here, you see. Uh, but they also have a very low HDI, which is very bad. So. Then the question is, what is a sustainable model? A sustainable model would be a country that would belong to this rectangle here. That is, that would have an HDI higher than 0.8 and an ecological footprint lower than one, at least by the standards of 2012. And as you see, unfortunately, this rectangle is empty. Nobody's there. Nobody is, this made, is in this magic square. Now it happens that, so, so in other words, Development and justice at least mean, according to me, that we all have to do something. We all have to migrate from the place where we are, be it here, here, or here, in order to converge towards this magic square here. That's, in other words, it seems to me, the agenda of, of the international community. Now, it happens that a couple of years ago, there was one country which was just on the edge here, with an HDI exactly equal to 0.8 and an ecological footprint exactly equal to one. And this country was Cuba. Nowadays, Cuba is a little bit, is here, as you see. So the HDI uh, declined, unfortunately. But then, of course, you could, you could wonder, is Cuba really a model that we want to follow? The answer obviously is no, is no. Why? Because of human rights. So in other words, um, it seems to me, a just sustainability transition for the future or sustainability paths, which for each country, and as you see, obviously they are country, they are country specific, uh, leads to this magic square, while at the same time 
uh, fostering human rights. And probably you are aware of the fact that in the international community, there is a very, very big temptation today, which is to say, you know, we can't do everything at the same time. So we will be forced to give up human rights in order to be able to end up somewhere here. Just a small illustration of that, if you look carefully at, at the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, on which the international community agreed um, in 2015, in New York, September 2015, uh, you know there are um, 17 SDGs, um, uh, so alleviating poverty, fostering uh, women, et cetera, et cetera, which are very fine, they are fantastic. The point is that you don't, you don't find the word democracy and you don't find the word human rights in the description, the official description of the 17 uh, sustainability development goals. And you might wonder why, how come? Do you know the bureaucrats in, in, in New York uh, who did that, do they believe that we, we can reach uh, a sustainable development goal uh, and give up democracy and human rights? And the answer is unfortunately yes. They were forced to give up at least the vocabulary of human rights and democracy under the pressure of China. And um, so you might say, you know, these are just words, it's not that important. But as you probably know, if you start cheating with words, at the end of the day, you cheat in your life. And uh, my fear is that this is exactly what we're doing. And I made exactly this experience when I was at the French Open Bank. So we had to write down the strategic plan of the bank for the next five years. And this was in 20, 2018. And um, so some of my colleagues said, oh, look, uh, the SDGs don't mention democracy and human rights. So why should we do it? And I said, I was a chief economist and I said, well, just because we are France and if France does not emphasize human rights and democracy, who is going to do this? Um, and then we had a big battle inside the bank on this topic. Some of my colleagues coming to me and saying, yeah, you don't want us to make, you don't want us to make business with China. And then me replying, but we don't have to make business with China. That's not a, that's not a goal in your life. Uh, we have to develop the planet, not to make business with China. So you, you can imagine the kind of discussion that we had. And unfortunately, I must confess, I lost the battle. So if you look carefully at the strategic plan of the French Open Bank by 2018, there is no mention of democracy and human rights. So this is one of the unfortunate consequences of the fact that there was already some actually already, let's say, lexical cheating in the way the SDGs have been phrased by 2015. Now I want to go much uh, much more rapidly for this for the next uh, the next slides. Uh, just I would like to quote um, Laudato Si, the encyclical, the beautiful encyclical uh, published by the Pope in, in June 2015. Um, this is number 123. Let me just read it. The same kind of thinking leads to the sexual exploitation of children and abandonment of the elderly who no longer serve our interests. It is also the mindset of those who say. Let us allow the invisible forces of the market regulate the economy and consider their impact on society and nature as collateral damage. I think this is a very, very strong statement which says the, the, the essential. That is, if we are Christians, we truly believe that everything is connected as the Pope says, in as much the way we treat uh, kids in our society, the way we treat elderly in our society, um, Say, tell something about the way we treat nature. That's my experience, at least. Very often, these are the same who, you know, uh, violate uh, and or sexually aggress kids, abandon elderly, and also neglect completely nature. And say, you know, the market is going to do the job. I don't need to take care of nature. I had an audience with the Pope um, on the 3rd September of 2020, last year, uh, two years ago now, uh, one year and a half ago. Um, and um, so he gave us a small, a kind of small uh, conference. And actually he came back to this number, 123, and he added a fourth item, which were women. So he said, it's not only the way we treat kids, the way we treat elderly people, and the way we treat nature, but also the way we treat women in our society. So we could say in a society where uh, there is such an, a, a huge gap between men and women, uh, kids and adults, elderly and non-elderly, human beings and non-human beings, then it's the same problem. We are missing something fundamental in the way we relate to each other and to the creation. Um, 
I would I just want to give you some hope because I know this is very gloomy. Um, so we have with my team, we have run, uh, I can go back to this if you want, but we have run a number of simulations in order to try to see whether we can avoid uh, the catastrophic, catastrophic situation I was just mentioning at the beginning. Um, and the answer is yes. So these are a number of simulations. Maybe it's not completely obvious, but here the, the vertical axis is the temperature at the temperature at the end of this century. And there are some scenarios according to our simulations, which, which land towards something smaller than two degrees. Um, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that I really believe that this is easy to be reached. I don't think so. Uh, this would be very hard, but at least on paper, it's not impossible. Now, if we keep doing nothing, uh, we will probably end up here. That's the most pessimistic scenario that the RCP 8.5 roughly plus five degrees at the end of this century. And my hope is that we land somewhere between this and this. In other words, we will have to adapt strongly uh, to um, uh, climate change. There will be uh, a significant global warming, warming in the second half of this century already. Actually, it's already happening today, but there are ways to, uh, to avoid the most catastrophic consequences of, of global change. What are these ways? Uh, to put it in a nutshell, but we can enter into the details. Um, uh, what I find is that, you know, a big carbon tax would be very, very instrumental. Uh, I was member of the Stern Stiglitz Commission at the international level on the carbon tax. And we were, we would all agree uh, with Nick Stern, you know, the, the, the former chief economist of the World Bank and Joe Stiglitz, uh, who got the Nobel award, but who is also a former chief economist of the World Bank, we would all agree that um, a carbon tax is a must. Um, so from my viewpoint, it's very unfortunate that the Biden administration doesn't want to implement it. I perfectly understand the issue that the poorest will be hit by carbon tax. And this again is a question of environmental, environmental justice. But then of course, there are ways you know, to compensate them. If you have a carbon tax, you have more uh, revenues for the state and the state can use these revenues to compensate for the poorest, which is exactly what the French government refused to do uh, under the, the, the presidency of Macron. And that's why he had the yellow vest, you know, uh, because he wanted to raise ca the carbon tax after having suppressed the tax on capital. Uh, and he didn't want to compensate for the poorest. So of course the poorest said, why should we pay the bill of climate change? There is no reason for that. Let us share the, the burden. And this is what, President Macron refused to do. So you see, I mean, to neglect environmental justice also has some political consequences, um, which does not mean that he will not be reelected in a few months in France. But I just want to end up to end with this uh, positive conclusion, which is that there are ways to circumvent the, the catastrophe. Uh, we need to be bold and very courageous. And I will stop here to uh, leave space for the conversation. So I moved again, but I will, I will, sorry, I will just, yeah. <laughs> well, even as you're moving, I just want to say on behalf of everyone, wow. <laughs>